Um, so welcome everyone for having your lunch. And uh, um, yeah, thank you for joining at noon. Um, I'm really um, uh, pleased to, um, to have Chris Tennant from Jefferson Lab today. Uh, Chris in a, is an accelerator physicist. He earned his PhD in, um, while working at Jefferson Lab in 2006. And he has been a staff scientist since then. Um, most of his research or all of his research focuses on the area of energy recovery um, uh, Linux for many applications, including electron cooling for electron ion colliders, free electron lasers for lithography and defense. And uh, recently has turned to um, applying uh, machine learning to improve beam operations. I, he will talk today about this. Um, and uh, Chris, I'll give you the floor. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to talk to you this uh, afternoon. I realize this title is a bit of a mouthful, but uh, we'll flesh this out shortly. So let me uh, just preface the talk by saying a few things about what this talk is not about. And so this is not about advancing the state of the art in machine learning, nor is it about implementing cutting edge algorithms. What it is, in fact, is it's actually conceptually simple machine learning classification but it's the development of this system uh, from data collection to implementation. And I'm hoping this will be useful or interesting to some of you just because of the valuable lessons learned along the way and discussing some of the challenges of working with real world. So let me just uh, summarize first actually to give you the overall picture. So we have a functional machine learning system deployed online for use for SRF fault classification exactly what that means in, in just a moment. We've received excellent initial results on operational data. We expect that this system will provide actionable information to subject matter experts in the next physics run, which is starting up right now. And then based on this initial success, we have a path forward to further leverage the data, which I'll explain later in the talk. Um, most of what I'm talking about today is uh, the details of which can be found in a recently uh, posted paper to archive. So if you're interested in following up. Here's just a brief outline. I want to say a few things about the current machine learning landscape in accelerator physics. I don't know how many in the audience uh, are, have that as their background. So I just want to give you a flavor of what it's like now uh, and also at Jefferson Lab. And then primarily talk about the SRF fault classifier in particular the supervised learning I will uh, discuss some work we've done with unsupervised learning, discuss future work, lessons learned, probably won't have time to talk about this in science, uh, and then summarize. So uh, artificial intelligence and accelerator physics actually has a fairly long history. So you can see these papers are from uh, the late 80s, early 90s, and people were already wondering and, and trying to figure out how to leverage machine learning uh, in this field. Uh, unfortunately, it just never really caught on, and there are a variety of reasons. Um, I particularly like the first sentence in this abstract, namely that neural nets have been described as a solution looking for a problem. And I think for a long time, that's kind of where we were uh, in the field. But just within the last, uh, I would say probably two years, there's really been an explosion of applications of AI in accelerator physics, as there have been in a number of other scientific disciplines as well. Um, so, for example, you can see the rise of peer-reviewed AI publications in the field, and this is just a small sampling. I could have added many more. Um, whereas, you know, two years ago, you wouldn't have found. There's a variety of reasons for that. Um, certainly, there has been uh, interest ever since this uh, machine learning for particle accelerators workshop started in 2018. It was held at Slack last year. It was held at PSI in Switzerland. Uh, unfortunately, this year's workshop, which was planned for South Korea, has been postponed till next year. But uh, events like this have started um, coming up more and more and really starting to uh, engage uh, the accelerator community. More um, locally, we hosted an AI for nuclear physics workshop at Jefferson Lab at the beginning of March. In fact, this was about a week before um, we all had to leave, start teleworking. Uh, but over the course of two and a half days, we had about 185 people, uh, various breakout sessions. Uh, so you can see the interest um, just in this event alone. If those are those that are interested, there is a uh, archive paper that gives you a summary of the results of this workshop. 
just as a side note, we uh, also had an AI hackathon the day before that workshop as a way to engage uh, whoever wanted to, to participate, but really try to engage um, students in particular. Uh, we had a really good turnout. Um, it was a really well uh, run event. And of course, you can see we had all the major AI hackathon food groups represented with donuts and chips and pizza. Um, but this is something that we definitely want to do in the future. It really was a We also have a, a weekly informal lunch series similar to maybe what you're doing um, an AI lunch series as a way to kind of galvanize and bring together the people at the lab that are interested in doing this kind of work. Uh, we also have a quarterly physics inspired machine learning problems kind of like a mini Kaggle. Uh, and then in the past year we've been able to secure a modest budget so that we could uh, bring in external speakers. Initially the idea was to actually bring those speakers physically to the lab but of course things changed quite rapidly and and as a result it worked out quite nicely is that we've been able to get uh, a much wider um, number of speakers from more locations, uh, many international in fact. Uh, that's some things that we're doing at our end. I just want to say a few words of introduction to Jefferson Lab. Um, as was noted in the introduction, I spent my whole career, uh, graduate work and up until now at one lab, at Jefferson Lab, and it's only within the past few years that I've begun to understand the depth and the breadth of the, the labs at the DOE complex. And so maybe some of you are, are not quite as familiar with that as well. So uh, you can see here, uh, Berkeley and Jefferson Lab are actually very close together. And we're on the, uh, the science side of the spectrum uh, rather than the technology, we're on the science side. But whereas uh, Berkeley is a multi-purpose science lab, uh, Jefferson Lab is a single program science lab. Um, so these numbers are very old, but they're just, they were helpful for me just to get a sense of what's going on. You can see uh, physically, similar size, but you can uh, see very So Jefferson Lab is a fairly small lab, a single program. And it's one of the newer labs founded in 1984. And so that brings us to uh, the topic at hand. Uh, we are a nuclear physics user facility. And the main machine that we have on site is called CVAF, the Continuous Electron Beam Accelerator Facility. Uh, this is a unique accelerator. This is called a recirculating LINAC. So um, you may be familiar with the idea of a linear accelerator, you know, something close to the gas, or you may be familiar with a storage ring. Uh, what a recirculating LINAC does is it takes the best bits of both and puts them together. So the, the beam makes several passes through this machine and to get to very high energies. And along the way, uh, beam can get sent to any one of four experimental halls simultaneously. And so the heart of this machine where the, the beam gets accelerated is the SRF cavities, the superconducting radio frequency cavities. The picture on the left shows you a view down one of those long Linux. It's just um, one cryo module after another after another. So what we want to do is uh, improve CBAF availability. This is a very busy plot, so I, and I won't go through it in great detail. What it's showing you is the number of trips on the vertical axis as a function of time in calendar year 2019. Each one of those bars represents a month in 2019, and each bar is color-coded according to the subsystem, how many trips from that particular subsystem. And the red and uh, orange are RF faults, and so they make up the, they contribute the most to these short downtime trips. And so there's a variety of different efforts focused at reducing these number of trips. Um, and the, the work that I'm talking about today is just one of those efforts. So I wanna make that clear that there are, there are other efforts aimed at addressing this problem as well, such as uh, refurbishing Linux hardware, um, upgrading the cryo modules and other things. So let's more formally define the problem. Um, we have the ability in several of the cryo modules to record uh, very information rich data, RF signals from those cavities. When a cavity trips, uh, it's immediately known because the beam turns off. Uh, that's obviously bad for the experimenters, and we're often running four experimental halls at one time. Um, the question we want to know is, or that we want answered is, when a cavity trips off, which cavity within a cryo module is the cavity that tripped off? 
It turns out it's not a trivial thing to figure out. That's question number one. Second is having identified that cavity, what kind of fault caused the beam to turn off? With that information, you know, knowing what kind of fault it was, it gives the operators information on how to respond. And that's very important to reduce faults in the future. So more formally, we want to train a model to correctly classify the cavity and type of RF fault given waveform data. Or you can think about in terms of machine learning, this is a multi-class classification problem. We're dealing with time series data. So we've, we've looked at this data in the past just using brute force analysis. We have a subject matter expert, his name is Tom Powers, and he loves looking at this data and he looks at this data and he analyzes it. Um, obviously, this is an incredibly busy plot. All I'm pointing out is that all, every one of these markers represents an event that he has gone through, looked at the data and manually labeled. So we had this labeled data available and it obviously, obviously made sense to leverage machine learning here. Now we're interested in, in the results of this analysis on two different timescales. The first is what I would call a post-run analysis. So we'll often run maybe six weeks uh, for a particular experiment. And the idea here is that after a run is complete, we use the aggregate statistics about the fault types and which cavities tripped for data-driven guidance for maintenance and or upgrade activities. And we've done this in the past, given the brute force um, data analysis. So for example, in the fall of 2018, it was noticed that you know, three particular cryomodules in the South Lenac were very susceptible to something called a microphonics-based fault, um, which justified going in and making modifications to those cavities and cryomodules, which in turn did help. Um, in the same way, we uncovered a firmware bug by looking at this data, which uh, once that was fixed, took away a number of faults. So this is very useful in, in the big picture. There's another time scale for which this is very interesting, and that's what I'm calling post-fault analysis. So that is uh, a cavity trips, and you want that information almost near real time because that provides critical feedback to control room. Ultimately, what we want is we want fault types to get mapped to actions for the operators. So something like if trip A happens, X times within Y minutes, then you do this. You drop the gradient. Very clear uh, procedures for the operators. So as I mentioned, we have this very nice data acquisition system that was developed in collaboration with several different groups at the lab. Um, and what, it ha what happens is that when a cavity trips, it triggers the system and the system records 17 RF signals and writes them to file. Okay, and so here's, imagine you have this streaming RF data. Um, this is the fault event right there. And what we're doing is we're taking a snapshot. The way the system is set up right now, we get about 94% of the data is actually data preceding the fault, which is important. And in total, it represents about 1.6 seconds worth of data. 8,000 samples times 0.2. So that is the, the raw data that we have to work with. What uh, you're gonna hear me say multiple times throughout the talk is that labeling is hard. So when you label the data, that means you have uh, one event, a cavity tripped, you have 17 signals per cavity times eight cavities in one cryo module. That means there's 136 traces, 136 traces of data to look at. Um, eventually we found that there's really four signals that are the most, have the most predictive power. But still, you're looking at a lot of signals, a lot of graphs um, to make uh, a label. So think of this more like um, annotating medical images rather than you know, distinguishing between cats and dogs. Labeling is uh, time uh, intensive. So this is kind of the visual outline that I'll refer back to during the talk. So we have this uh, continuous data coming in from the left as I described, we have this data acquisition system, which is triggered when a cavity faults. I mentioned that we have uh, someone that loves the data, likes looking at it, and will label it, which is great. And because of that, we can then generate features and then leverage machine learning. And of course, the output of this is we want actionable information, something that we can provide to the operator. 
So here's a little bit more about the data set. Um, we gathered data from uh, January 18th of 2019 to uh, early March of this year. It went through several checks to be included in this. In the end, we have eight cavities uh, times four signals per cavity. And then we uh, do feature extraction. To do feature extraction for these time series signals, we fit them with six autoregressive coefficients. So for one event, we have eight cavities, four signals per cavity, six features per signal. We have a um, feature vector of 192, length 192. In all, we have 2,300 labeled events. And as I say, each event is 192 features. And you can see the distribution according to the label. So the cavity label uh, shown there on the left and then the fault label on the right. And this data is um, publicly available if anyone is interested. So here's the uh, general workflow for developing these machine learning algorithms. We have this uh, master feature set and we're actually going to um, train two different machine learning um, models on it. We're just going to use the different labels for each one. So remember, we have two questions we want to answer. Which cavity faulted? And then given which cavity faulted, which kind of fault was it? So we train, we, um, we evaluate a number of different models. We select one model, we do some hyperparameter tuning, test it, and then ultimately deploy it. So pretty standard uh, workflow. So we split the data into a train and test set, and we're using tenfold cross-validation scores and evaluate several different um, models. So the cavity identification model is shown on the left. The fault identification model is shown on the right. And uh, you can see the accuracy, accuracy scores there go from 0.5 to 1. Um, the foremost markers on each plot represent ensemble models, and they generally perform so what we ended up doing after looking at these and, and just the, the nice features that a random forest has is we chose the random forest model and then we performed hyperparameter optimization for each one of those models. We get the results shown in the table below. So if we use cross validation and then we also check by uh, doing the accuracy test on the withheld test set, you can see that the cavity identification model has an accuracy of something like 88% and the fault type model something like We had the opportunity to deploy these models and run them you know, online during beam operations uh, in the early part of March. Uh, we were hoping to be able to run for several weeks. Unfortunately, uh, the physics run was prematurely ended due to pain. Nevertheless, we were able to get about two weeks of data. And in that time period, there were two, or sorry, 312 fault events that were analyzed by the models. Uh, so here's the summary of the performance of the models compared to the labeled data. So at the same time, I should mention that uh, during this time, Tom was actively labeling these on his own so that we could compare the human label with the model prediction. So for the cavity model, out of the, the possible uh, 312 uh, labels, we agreed with the labels 265 times, and with the fault model, we agreed 244 times gives you a, a cavity model accuracy of about 85%. And then I remind you of the testing accuracy below that. And then the fault model accuracy uh, fell off a little bit. It was only 78% compared to this most likely predict. So here we can um, look at the model performance a little more carefully using a, using a, a confusion matrix. If you're not familiar with this, this is a nice way of checking out how well a classifier performs. Um, the true label are the rows, and then the predicted label is the columns. Um, if everything agreed perfectly, then all the on-diagonal pieces would be uh, blue and have 100%. Um, so what's nice is this really tells you, as the name suggests, where the model is getting confused. Um, so if you look over here on the right for the fault prediction, for example, the human labeler says there are a number of these heat riser chokes, this kind of a fault. Unfortunately, our model didn't recognize it at all. And so that caused us to go in and investigate a little bit more, and I'll, I'll spare you the details. But this is really useful in understanding you know, where the model is getting confused 
Thus far, we have assumed that the labels from the human labeler are the ground truth. Uh, but we also know, as I mentioned, that this labeling is really difficult to do. So we asked the question, just how reproducible is our human labeler? Um, and so what we did is we looked at uh, these 312 events. Each event has the possibility of two labels. Okay, so for this set of uh, this run, we have a possible three, or sorry, 624 um, labels. It turns out that 115 of those uh, disagreed with the human labeler. and They're represented by 84 events. So I took all those 84 events where we disagreed with the labels, and I randomly selected 84 events where we complete, completely agreed with the labels, and mixed them all up and sent them back and asked uh, Tom to label them again. I didn't give him any information about how he had labeled them previously, but I just wanted to see how consistent he was in labeling from, uh, you know, a few weeks ago to uh, a new time. And the results were very interesting. So if I gather his information back and I look at the events that initially agreed with his results, it turns out that he only gave two of the 168 labels a different label, which I think is pretty remarkable. So all those labels, he only wavered two times uh, between those two labels. On the other hand, if I get to the events that disagreed, it turns out that he gave 58 out of those 168 labels different labels than the first time around. And that breaks down to 21 different cavity identifications and 37 different. So this tells us uh, a lot of information, uh, but if we used his uh, newest labels and we calculate the, the performance, we can see that it actually improves quite a bit. Now, I'm not arguing or suggesting that this is the right answer now. All I'm, I want to emphasize is that the performance of the model varies quite a bit because there is some inconsistency with how the data is labeled. That points to a more fundamental issue that, as I say, labeling for this task is difficult. And the model struggles where the subject matter experts struggle. It's not too surprising. So uh, the next thing we want to do, I mean, the models are performing well. Certainly it gives useful information, useful information for the operators. Um, the next thing we have spent some time doing is making sure that we're visualizing it and communicating this information well. Um, and so we've spent a lot of time creating these plots and figuring out how to get them into the hands of people that need to know. This is just an example showing some of the spatial and temporal nature of the model predictions. There's a timeline on the top. You can interact with those um, markers. You can hover over them and get information. Then we have these heat maps, which is very helpful. It gives you, uh, from a quick glance, uh, where things are most active, where things need attention. Uh, so this is fairly new. And we just started rolling these out uh, within the past few days, actually. Uh, creating these automated reports that go to uh, subject matter experts so that they can see the results. Okay, so I've talked about machine learning, uh, coming back to this schematic and this diagram here. Um, we also started looking at deep learning. So deep learning would um, give us the opportunity to avoid the feature extraction step altogether and um, simplify things in some ways. I should point out that this is a work of a postdoc that we have working. His name is Lasitha. Uh, he's done some very nice work, and so I just want to make sure that this is recognized as his work. Um, because we're dealing with sequential data, we're going to use something like an LSTM. He used a bi-directional LSTM. And then uh, he built up this uh, two-branched model. So once again, we're training for the fault identification and the cavity identification. So he built up this model and he ran a number of tests. And uh, this is the dreaded wall of numbers. I promise I'm not gonna go through this in great detail. Uh, but what I wanna point out is if you look at the top row, this is using all the data from all the cavities and all the fault classes. Next row down is just using the four um, signals per cavity, the four that are, have the most predictive power and all the fault classes. The bottom one just uses four waveforms plus the three uh, most uh, frequent fault types. And what I want to point out is that there's a huge discrepancy between the train and validation accuracies. Um, and so that just tells us that there is serious overfitting happening. 
Um, and so he did try regularization. He tried uh, dropout layers and the like, but just could not um, uh, reconcile this, uh, the train and validation accuracy. So we think there's overfitting with the class and balance. And we also think that the, na the labeling noise that I, that I referred to already, that some of these labels are not consistent. Uh, and so it just is hard for the model to learn. We also looked at an autoencoder. So it's comprised, of course, many of you are familiar with these. Uh, an encoder produces a compressed version of the data. And then the decoder uses this uh, context vector to reconstruct the input. And so he did this, um, which is a little more difficult to do when you're dealing with uh, sequences. Uh, but it's, it's something that's used in natural language. And he trained uh, this model and uh, with also some interesting results. So uh, he did a little bit of data pre-processing. It's not really important. But here's one of the experiments that he did. He wants to reconstruct four signals. And he's only considering data from a single fault class. Okay, so it should be fairly uniform. Here's uh, one of the results. The uh, blue traces indicate the, uh, the raw data. The red traces show the reconstruction. So you get reasonable reconstruction. Maybe the lower left plot is a bit off, but you, you get basically the trends, not too bad. He then looked at another example from this data set. And well, what do we find? Well, the red traces are the same. Uh, unfortunately, the scale look a little bit different. You can see that the blue traces, the input signal, vary widely. And so this surprised us because we were under the assumption that if this is the same fault type, if this is labeled as the same fault, then the input signal should be pretty much the same from one event to the other. And that's clearly not the case. Uh, this is, represents uh, a, an area where we need to do some more work. We need to go back, first of all, to see if this is a mislabeled event or if this kind of fault uh, presents itself differently at different times, in which case um, it, it, it's gonna require some more thinking about how we do the learning. So uh, it seems like as the more and more we, we look into this, we're finding more interesting things about how the data is labeled and we're learning about that. Okay, so that covers kind of the supervised learning aspects. I talked about machine learning and deep learning on the data. Uh, I just want to mention some work exploring unsupervised learning that we did on the features as a way to learn something about these labels. Uh, so a common theme is that, you know, these labels are really driving a lot of the work here. Um, I won't go through this in any detail. I'm sure you're very familiar with unsupervised learning. The idea that uh, there's dimensionality reduction, which we do take advantage of. So we're reducing the dimensionality of our data mostly so that we can visualize it. And then there's clustering, and we want to we want to look for underlying features, underlying patterns that might emerge that might give us insight into the data set. Um, so, as an example, many of you are familiar with the MNIST handwritten uh, data set. So it's a very high dimensional space, but you can use dimensionality reduction to visualize this in two dimensions, and you get something like this, where it's very clear that um, digits are clustered together. Um, so we were, you know, in a fairly optimistic, hoping we would get something like that. Uh, it turns out it didn't really turn out that way. So when we uh, applied um, uh, PSNE visualization to look to convert our data from 24 dimensions to two dimensions, we get the plot shown here. And uh, certainly there are clusters. And then here's a little zoomed in plot to try to figure out what's going on. Certainly there are clusters, but it's not clear exactly what's going on. So there's a nice blue cluster here, but there's also a blue cluster over here, a nice green cluster here, and also one over here. So this was um, obviously not as clean as we would have liked, but on the other hand, probably not too surprising either. We tried putting it into three dimensions, wondering if that extra dimension would help uh, sort things out and give a added separation. Uh, not so much. So what we did is we just looked at them um, by their fault type. So we looked at a particular kind of fault. We uh, did the dimensionality reduction uh, down to two dimensions. And these are the results that we get. Uh, they're ordered according to the frequency 
with which these these fall down. This is the most frequent fall uh, going down to the leaf tree. Um, and so for at least the top three in that top row, it appears that there is some structure. There is some clustering there. For the middle three, it's not clear if what you're seeing is clusters or if you're just seeing, you know, the granularity of the fact that there's just not a whole lot of data there. So we looked at the top three in a little bit more detail. And we did some clustering analysis using DB scan, which is a, a density based uh, way of doing clustering. And it appears that there are some distinct clusters, which is interesting. Uh, so for the single cavity turnoff, uh, it kind of matches up with what you'd expect visually that it creates these two clusters. The microphonics has three, and this quench on the right has three different clusters. So I was looking at this, thought this was very interesting, and I said, oh, well, I should probably share this with our labeler and see what his take on this is. Uh, so I said, you know, we had this single cavity turnoff, and it shows these two distinct clusters. Are you surprised by that? And he said no, and that in fact, he changed the way he labeled these kinds of evol these events um, after the spring of 2019. Well, our data set includes uh, data prior to spring 2019 and after spring 2019. So it could very well be that what we're seeing is the way that he changed how he labeled. Now this still has to be confirmed and we're working on that. But, um, he wasn't surprised. So then I said the microphonics, well we see three distinct clusters. Once again, he was not surprised. He says that sometimes a microphonics fault is due to these 10 hertz oscillations. Sometimes it's due to these short high frequency bursts. So these faults manifest themselves in different ways. Then said same thing about the quench, that there's three clusters and once again he was not surprised. So this is once again motivating some more uh, a deeper dive into the, the raw data, how it's labeled. Should it be labeled more finely, broken out into more uh, on the other hand, he said the controls fault, which is a different kind of a fault, also presents itself differently. But when we did the dimensionality reduction, it actually looked pretty smooth. So still lots of open questions, lots of things. All right, so talked about supervised learning, we talked about unsupervised learning. I want to talk a little bit about future directions, or at least the hope of what we'd like to do. And that is to bypass the data acquisition system altogether and to deal directly with the continuous data. Okay, so do some what's called data stream mining or online learning. Right now, uh, imagine we have this streaming data, we saw this uh, schematic before, that dotted box represents the saved data that we work with right now. We're taking just a small snapshot of the streaming data. It turns out the data that you need for classification actually is really just pretty well localized around the fault event itself. So the question is, uh, can we use this data prior to the event to say something about the fault that is about to happen? Can we predict it? So we wanted to investigate this further. We're using saved waveforms and asking the question, can the data prior to the event provide information about the type of the vault? So at time equals zero is the onset of the fault itself. And what we're going to do is we're going to take data from the very start to say uh, 300 milliseconds before the fault, train a classifier, and then check its performance. Uh, so use an F1 score, for example, and we'll plot that point. And then we'll say, well, let's happens if we take a little bit more data, we can get closer to the fault event. How does the accuracy of the classifier uh, behave? Now intuitively, you would think that it would get a little bit better. And then you continue this all the way up to uh, the fault event itself. Intuitively, you would think that uh, things would get better until it converges to the value when you use all the data. So we looked at that. Once again, this is just a very preliminary initial investigation. We looked at that for each one of the faults. Um, so these plots can be a little confusing. T equals zero here represents when, we use, when we've used the most amount of data. 600 represents when we've used the least amount of data. So for the top middle plot, the quench, 100 millisecond, um, it actually agrees with how we thought it would. You know, the performance gets better as you use more data as you get closer to the event. And actually the, 
Same thing with the microphonics, uh, the single cavity turn off, the upper left there. Uh, oddly enough, it's kind of uh, independent of the amount of data you use, which is interesting. And then the ones on the bottom uh, just are, are quite bad. They don't do well at all. So the model is able to predict, at least for some faults, with up to several hundred milliseconds of lead time. Uh, but as I say, it's fault dependent. So this is going to motivate uh, continued study. And the real question is, all right, so given that we have several hundred milliseconds or so, is there any mitigations that could be implemented on those time scales that would actually avoid the fault altogether? Okay, so not just telling you something about it, but let's do something. Let's be proactive about it. Um, yeah, so this is the machine learning for streaming data. Conventional machine learning are normally trained and tested using static data sets, right? But here we're treating the data as an infinite stream and we need to continuously update the model. And this is important, um, I think for a lot of accelerator applications in fact, because if you imagine that we want to store this data indefinitely, we're talking about, as I say, 136 signals per fault event being sampled at kilohertz rates during operations that will last uh, six weeks at a time, multiple times a year, you're dealing with backups, then just the storage alone becomes cost prohibitive. So the idea here is that you have a model that can look at the data, um, learn from it, make a prediction, and then discard the data. And that's going to be important, I think, because accelerators just have a huge number of these streaming signals. And it just doesn't make sense to be able to save every single one of them with the resolution that you need. All right, so let me just um, start wrapping up, talking about a few lessons learned. Um, as I said multiple times already, labeling, at least for this, this application, is hard and it's expensive. So we're trying to understand these very complex physical mechanisms happening underneath the hood that gives rise to this data. And it really is a non-trivial thing. The other thing, as I mentioned, is that uh, so far what we're seeing is that the model struggles where the subject matter expert struggles. And this should not be too surprising, right? If the subject matter expert is confused about certain kinds of events, it's going to manifest itself in the training data and therefore what the model learns. The other thing that we've learned, and I, I read this and I knew it in my mind, but just didn't take it to heart, is do not rush the data exploration step. Um, don't underestimate both the value and time spent on this step. You know, we were so excited to get this data, so eager to, to run this through some models and see if we could get some um, helpful results, but we did not spend enough time cleaning the data, you know, just getting rid of duplicate entries. Sometimes we would have duplicate entries with different labels, which obviously is a horrible thing if you're trying to, to uh, train a machine learning model. Uh, so don't rush that step. Feature extraction is time consuming. Um, we initially went down the road of using uh, a third party software, PS Fresh, which extracts uh, features from time series data. But there are some potential issues with version control and robustness that we didn't feel comfortable with. So uh, we spent a long time uh, kind of doing that. If you can avoid feature extraction, that's, that would be ideal. And that's kind of where we're heading. We're just hoping that we can get the accuracy learning models. And then we're facing this uh, funny situation where, in fact, there are less trips in the machine uh, due to a number of factors, which is obviously good for operations, great for our users, but it's bad for us in that we're starting to develop these data-hungry deep learning models. It's a funny catch-22 situation we're in right now. I wanted to say a few things about um, what I think are some factors for our, our very modest success. Uh, what I mean by success is that we do have a trained and tested machine learning model that's deployed online. It's yielding useful information. That information is getting in hands. Um, the first is that we have access to information-rich data. And I can't stress this enough. So remember, <clears throat> we have a, a specially designed data acquisition system that allowed us to get this data. If we didn't have that system, um, the data that we currently collect from the cavities is way too slow. It would not give us the resolution to do anything useful on the order. So having information-rich data uh, is absolutely essential. 
Second, uh, I think what made it easier is that the data is collected non-invasively. So you can imagine, um, you know, experimenters want as much beam as possible, and if accelerator physicists come in asking for beam time so they can collect data, that's really not ideal. Um, but our data is collected parasitically, non-invasively, and that's it works well for everybody. Thirdly, we have a willing and able data labeler. Can't say enough about this. As I said, this is a, a difficult task. This isn't, you know, um, clicking on the screen to identify the sign in the screen or you know some of those. Uh, this requires a lot of hard work and dedication, and, and someone has to be very passionate about the data to do this. Unfortunately, we have someone that is willing to do that. And then, lastly, um, we really do want to keep the human in the loop here. Um, so this article came out in Symmetry Magazine last year talking about the future of particle accelerators may be autonomous. And this is really <laughs> the exact opposite of the thing that we wanna communicate, the idea that there's gonna be this robot running the machine. What we're trying to stress is that we are providing augmented intelligence, that we are providing new information that was previously unavailable so that the humans can still make um, decisions. So that's where we are. Uh, at the moment. So just in summary, uh, we've made significant progress in the last year. We do have, as I say, this deployed. We have very good initial results, and we expect that the system will start providing feedback to the subject matter experts during this current phys uh, physics run. We're bringing the machine up even as we speak. Hopefully, it uh, will be sent to uh, experimental halls by the end of the month. And we're gonna continue to accumulate and label the data. The future work, as I mentioned, we want to use unsupervised learning to, to understand more about the labels themselves. We're going to train on additional data and hopefully develop more robust uh, deep learning architectures. Um, so we think CBEF is a great test bed for applying these AI-driven solutions, and there's, there's lots of ways that we think we can do that, uh, which we hope to expand upon. Let me just acknowledge my collaborators. Uh, without them, this work would not have been possible, so I just want to make sure that they are uh, mentioned. And then uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Chris. Uh, this was uh, uh, very extensive, actually. So thank you. Um, maybe we have uh, questions. Anyone uh, has any questions? Yeah, I question. So. The reason you had different outcomes based upon repredicting it, it wasn't that your probabilities changed from your machine learning when you ran through it and they're just numbers that shouldn't actually change. But you're not updating anything, like you're not actually, if like you're not adjusting it, right? So if you go through, just make the same predictions again. Is it, it's largely, is it largely because you have different predictions is because of um, your, how you decide to make predictions in the end after you get your probability uh, probabilities of it being this label versus that label. Um, so where you, let's say you have some kind of epsilon tolerance around like 50%, say 40 to 60%, where you just let the machine say if it's between 40 to 60%, and you say it's either labeled this or that, and you just, you just let it you make it choose. It doesn't necessarily have a deciding factor to say, oh, it's 90% probability saying it's this, so it must be this. All right, so I, I'm not sure if I understood it correctly. So certainly the the answer from the machine learning model should not change. Um, I don't know if you're referring to this, maybe? Yes, yes. Okay, so the reason of the change here is that the labels changed for the data that we input. So yes, the model did not change at all. Uh, the labels changed. Um, maybe, wanna uh, ask that again? So like the reason for it changing is so, let's say you uh, the deciding factor in how the model actually decided uh, whether it was this label or that label was based upon a probability, uh, and then, and you just say you just pick the this hypothetical you pick the maximum probability to say it was either going to be this label or that label, uh, but then you give a range, uh, so you know if it falls exactly on fifty percent, then it, it yeah obviously isn't going to decide it very well either way. But let's say the, these didn't fall exactly on 50%, but let's say you gave some kind of epsilon uh, range around 50% to say, then let's say 40 to 60%. So if it was to predict that it was this label 
let's say you only have two cases, for example, and it, it falls into the it's either uh, 60 to 40 percent range, so one minus it would also obviously be the other. Then you're just saying it's still very unsure at, at the 40 to 60 percent uh, probability prediction of it really being any true label. So you're just having it to decide this just pick one, not so much of it, it has no determining factor as much as it's just saying to pick one at that point. Mm. So we cert we do actually look at like the probability, um, the confidence level of these predictions. And unfortunately, I've, I haven't seen a great uh, correlation with how well it agrees with the label. Um, so sometimes it's very, very, con the model is very convinced that it has it right and it's completely wrong. Sometimes it's very convinced that it's right and it's right. So oh, no, no, no. I mean, I'm talking about the fact that they're relabeled, right? That's the reason for the relabel. Yes. Okay. Like when it's wrong, it's, I mean, even though it says a 9% prediction for saying if this should be the right thing, it's still wrong. It's just that with 9% prediction, when you feed that through again, it'll still have the 90% prediction that it still thinks it's this label. So it'd still be wrong. Like that, that shouldn't change. Right, right. So if it's changing labels, it's falling within some range of something where the uh, the decision, the, the actual, what the machine says it's going to say as its prediction, right? It's either going to be this label or that label. It's falling within that range of that probability prediction that it's then just choosing to make one or the other, which uh, that, that's, I guess that's my question. So then it would be to that happened to be like of the ones that got wrong, 58 of those kind of actually fell into that into that matter. And then for like the ones they disagreed with, and then like the other 110, it definitively just got extremely wrong. Yeah, so I, I that's, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. I think we have another question, Mariam. Um, yeah, I was just hoping you could read it out, but um, my question was, uh, does your data have noise? Uh, and if it does, do you think that you need to filter this out to improve your predictions? The raw data, um, the, let's see, does it have noise? Hmm. I would say, no, I don't think, well, I don't think it has noise. Um, these are, are reading, you know, very, this is raw signal is coming right from the system. Um, it's very little processing to get these signals. I don't think it's a noisy signal. Um, we can vary the, the, the um, sampling frequency. Right now it's five kilohertz. We've done um, more than that. Uh, we don't see a lot of difference in how models perform. But I don't think there's any, one, I mean, we have done some processing on the raw data when we do deep learning, only because some of these sequences are quite long. So we're dealing with, you know, 8,000 points and uh, we've, you know, cropped some of it or we've downsampled a little bit. Um, but I don't think noise is an issue. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, I have a question about uh, your online learning stuff. So you said that you have a, a model deployed already, right? That's correct. Um, so can, can you talk a little bit about the sampling rates and, and where is the, the model is deployed? Like, is it on an FPGA or is it just using CPU? Um, yeah. Um, so everything that I've been talking about, the work that we've done thus far, is like a post-mortem analysis. So a trip happens, data is recorded, and it's written to file. Once that happens, we run a script which grabs the data, uh, extracts features, and then runs it through the model just on a, on a server. And the, the amount of time that that takes to get the data, get the features, run it through the model is something like a few seconds, and we certainly didn't try to optimize it for speed. We're not trying to get 
real time performance, just something that's you know near real time. Um, so it's a very basic implementation. Uh, we had talked about trying to get this closer to the edge at some point, trying to put some maybe uh, deep learning models on FPGA, for example. Um, but for now, this is all that is required. You know, the time scales are something on the order of getting information back in a few seconds. I see. Thank you. So if, if you do, like, if, if you actually do want to have a real-time implementation, then what should the latency of the model be? Uh, well, I guess that depends if we, th I mean, I don't know if it's, it's possible. Ideally, in, uh, let's see, let me get to the, ideally you would like to be able to pick up some information prior to the fault, be able to run it through a model. It would say there is an impending fault, it's of this type, and then have enough time to do some sort of a mitigation factor. Um, I don't know exactly what that time scale would be. It probably depends on the type of fault. There are some faults where you simply wouldn't have enough time to do anything. Other faults like microphonics faults, they can be picked up, you know, several hundred milliseconds before the actual event, which may give you enough time to actually do something. But in terms of, you know, exact numbers, I, I don't know off the top of my head. Ah, okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, well, also have a question. Thank you very much for an interesting presentation. Um, just uh, looking at this slide, I have a question about these precursors for the fault, which you're looking for. So you have studied uh, events starting from the fault time and to the negative, right? I mean, you're looking how similar these are compared to those uh, which happened just before the fault. But uh, the question is, did you look further down, further, further to the negative? I mean, are they just self-similar? Or are you looking for something really specific to the fault here? Or you're just looking for some self-similarity of any signal you pick anywhere along this time scale and just look in both directions and see how self-similar it is. So the question is, is it specific to the fault or is it just like uh, self-reproducibility of the signal you are studying here? Well, so this is a very generic signal that I chose, probably not the best example, yeah. but depending on the type of fault that you have, you will have, um, certain signatures beforehand. Uh, the best one that I can give is a microphonics fault. I think that's the one I showed here, which shows very large oscillations in one of the signals um, prior to, let's see. Yeah, so here in this, this is a phase. Very large oscillations. This is very indicative of a microphonics fault. For this would not be present in any of the other kinds of faults. So we're looking for features that are correlated with a particular kind of fault. And we only looked a few hundred milliseconds prior because that's all the data we have at this point. I mean, obviously we would like to look, look even further back to see what that tells us, but um, we only save, you know, this small snapshot. But I, I believe you showed another slide where the microphonics was kind of close to the same level as you go away from the from the fault. Oh, so it wasn't oh, yeah, very okay. specific, right? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the question is, this microphonics, for example, this may happen, let's say, many seconds before the fault, uh, and it may look just the same. So how do you know it's specific to the fault? I mean, you know it happens before the fault, but may also happen many times before the fault happened, many seconds before that. And how do you know oh. it's specific that the fault is going to happen right now and not, let's say, 10 seconds away when you maybe also had some microphonics? I see. I see. No, that's, that's a very good point. Um, yeah, so given the data that we're dealing with, I, I can't, I don't know, basically. But that is something very useful to think about moving forward. Yeah. Thank you. Any more questions? So Chris, how do you, um, uh, do you expect to have um, uh, new events that you don't have in your training data set, like out of training data distribution? Oh, that is, that is a big question. 
Um, so I actually just had a little correspondence with um, the guy that labels them, Tom, and you know, I basically asked, you know, what is your, th the, the trouble with this problem is that he as the labeler and we as people developing the models are both being introduced to this new data at the same time. So he is learning how to label the data as we are learning to train the models. Um, and so when he first started training, he had a few classes of fault types in his mind. And so he would try to put the data into those buckets. But as he looked more and more, you know, a few thousand in, he realized, oh, there's this other fault that doesn't quite fit. So I'm gonna make a new class. And so <laughs> the first time he did the data, there were four fault classes. Uh, the next time he labeled the data, there were eight fault classes. And so, yeah, it's, there is a little evolution of how um, the labeling is done. And it very well may be that there are faults that we haven't identified yet, which is why we wanted to do the unsupervised learning. Um, you know, maybe these clusters suggest not only if a, um, a fault is mislabeled, but maybe it's an entirely new fault. It should have its own class. Um, so, yeah, like I say, the more we get into this, more more we realize we really need to focus on the labeling and understand that more carefully. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I wish accelerators just needed to know if it was a cat or a dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like I, I think like the, the, the one of the reasons this I find this very interesting the, is that um, we um, only recently we started to see actually like people who have actually try to deploy these models in uh, in real life and what sort of problems and what sort of things one needs to think about, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Apart from doing, you know, cat and dog classification. <laughs> yeah, so this is this is very interesting, yeah. Um, I think we have maybe one more minute for questions. Anyone else? Okay. If not, Chris, thank you again uh, so much. And uh, I know it's late uh, where you are. And uh, yeah, we certainly enjoyed your presentation and um, all the work. Thank you very much for the Thanks. invitation. Great.